Welcome to session uh, Cops in Crisis, what seems to be the matter officer. Um, I'm Neil Davenport, I'm the convener of this strand on institutions uh, in crisis. I'm also a regular contributor to Spite Online and I'm head of sociology at the JFS uh, Sixth Form Centre. Before I introduce the panellists, uh, I just want to explain a bit about what this uh, session will hopefully uh, uh, dig up. I think in the past, one of the most solid and perhaps authoritative British institutions, uh, especially when it came to defending the existing social order, was definitely the police. I think it perhaps its current difficulties today most dramatically reveals the process of institutional uh, meltdown uh, in the UK. And you, you know, you can argue that the police have gone through various institutional me uh, meltdowns uh, in the recent past, most famously perhaps after the uh, McPherson report uh, in 1999. So the police find a, a, are in an odd situation, I think, is that they do not face militant trade unionists on picket lines. They do not face football hooligans on a Saturday afternoon or confrontational mass demonstrations at the scale of that they were in the past. Yet barely a day goes by without a new accusation against the police uh, in some form. You know, for the past year, the Plebgate's <laughs> debacle has rumbled on with uh, Andrew Mitchell. The Hillsborough inquiry is never far from the headlines. Only this week, uh, accusations of spying on protesters and collaborating with the building trade uh, to list to blacklist trade unionists. It seems the, the latest scandal to soil the reputation uh, of the police. So it does seem that everybody's gunning for the police uh, on all angles. But I just want to pose something else as well. Uh, at the same time, you have the odd situation whereby the police are constantly criticised for these developments you get a number of radicals who actually don't mind if the police eject football fans from chanting offensive songs in football grounds uh, or arresting individuals for what they tweet or put on Facebook. Over the summer, a lot of high-pro feminists were also hoping that the police would arrest and imprison men for sending threatening tweets uh, to feminist uh, journalists. So I think with this session, what I want to take a look at, you know, is the police out of touch with the times? Is it, you know, not, is it failing to respond to the times or is it responding to demands for tighter policing of petty behaviour? Equally, police also seem to be a bit schizophrenic, going in hard on free speech and free assembly, but unsure and nervy when faced with a serious outbreak of violence, as was the case in London and elsewhere two years ago. Uh, has the police evolved uh, to mean something new in the 21st century or does it feel that its hands are increasingly tied as it comes under these uh, increasing scrutiny. So these are some of the issues that hopefully we will discuss today. We don't have a great deal of time, so I want to briefly introduce uh, the panellists uh, before taking questions and contributions from the audience. First of all, to my far right, but not, not literally, uh, we have Kirk Leach, uh, who's the Interim Director of the European Animal Research Campaign Centre of Government Affairs and Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry. To my immediate right, we have Professor Clive Bloom, uh, English and American Studies at uh, uh, University of Middlesex and the author of Riot City, Protest and Rebellion in the Capital. Uh, to my immediate left, we have David Petch, retired uh, Commissioner of the Independent Police Complaints Commission. To my further left, we have Dr. J uh, Jackie uh, Tapley, uh, Principal Lecturer and Associate Head of the Institute of Criminal Justice Studies at the University uh, of Portsmouth. And to my far left, we have Professor Roger Graff, uh, award-winning documentary maker of the police series Police 2001, uh, and Turning the Screws, and is also a, a criminologist as well. So, OK, let's uh, start the debate. Uh, Kirk, would you like to begin, please? Thank you. Um, in preparing for this speech, I kind of dug out a speech I gave on the streets of Bradford Police Station, um, unbelievably, 28 years ago. Uh, I've been arrested by the police for organising what they call vigilante patrols. Uh, what we were doing was effectively helping local community deal with racist attacks on, on the Pakistani community. And I've been arrested by the police and put in jail. And I'd spend about 10 hours, I think. And I came out and made this kind of like great speech, I thought. And I remember one thing, this, when I looked at my speech, one thing that jumped out of it was I, I said that we should kick the police off our streets. And the 50 or so people who were there at the time, mass applause, 
um, you know, in, in full support of what I said. And at that time, making those kind of statements would seem, didn't seem particularly ridiculous. This was a year since the miners' strike, where the British police were organised in a very paramilitary fashion, without numbers, arresting over 12,000 miners in a year-long bitter dispute. It was one year since the death of Cynthia Jarrett, who'd been murdered by the police on Broadwater Farm in North London and Tottenham, which led to a riot, and the first policeman to die in a riot since 1833 died in those days. And making a kind of anti-police speech in those days would have seemed pretty okay. Um, given that, given my background and given my experience, I think, when I was on the streets doing stuff, I was arrested eight times by the police. I'd been, had up close and personal secret surveillance. I'd seen friends fitted up. I'd seen friends beaten up by the police and myself. You think, given that, that I would be welcoming the current mess the police are in. But actually, I don't. And it's not because I'm 28 years older. There are two real reasons why I think it's quite dangerous to jump on the kind of anti-police bandwagon. Firstly, if you look at who's orchestrating this kind of anti-police criticism, it's really or being orchestrated by sections of the media and sections of the establishment, numbers of politicians, for self-serving reasons. And I would argue neither of these sides are particularly attacking the police for anything progressive. What seems to me to be happening is that elements of the establishment are kind of feeding off the moral decay and incoherence of the police for their own reasons. I don't think either side is particularly worth supporting. My second reason of being not particularly interested in jumping on the anti-police bandwagon is that it kind of exhibits a real degree of historical amnesia about what the police really is and what the police was in the past. Take Plebgate, which was just mentioned. Clearly it's not right that the police lied at 10 Downing Street. Clearly it's not right that the police lied when they met Mitchell afterwards. However, these incidents pale in comparison to the history of the British police of fitting people up over the years. Anybody can remember back the Birmingham Six or, or, the, or the Guildford Three, or even the Tottenham Three who were arrested after the Broadwater Farm riot, imprisoned for life, and let's not forget, without any evidence, forensic evidence, or any kind of witnesses at all. So the kind of full shock by the media and the full shock by the establishment that, my God, how can our police lie, exhibits a real degree of political uh, amnesia. It's also worth remembering even the death of Ian Tomlinson, the non-G20 protester on the G20 protests. Clearly, again, it shouldn't have happened. Clearly, again, it was unacceptable. But, you know, let's just remember the kind of like um, the idea that the police in the past have not beaten out beatings, particularly the black community and others, over the years. Again, the shock of this happening in front of the cameras and going on and on and on forgets what the police in the past are really like. I'm not really trying to score cheap points and say that my memory is better than others. What I'm trying to say is that these two things aren't particularly aberrations um, away from a kind of normally trusted police force. And I think to do so ignores the simple fact that stripped away, pulled naked, the foundation of the capitalist state's power is an armed body of men. And a central part of the state's apparatus, the primary role of the police, has been to protect private property and importantly maintain public order. And historically this job has been carried out in the face of a lot of kind of public hostility because they had the full backing of the establishment. And this is one of the kind of unique things that's happening today, actually, I would say, is that those sections of the establishment who in the past would have been very pro-police, sections of the media and sections of the establishment, are the ones orchestrating this kind of anti-police uh, moment. What's also unique is that the public, the people who were outside Bradford Police Station 28 years ago, in general, are not particularly taken by this. And in general, I would say, are not particularly taken by this kind of anti-police rhetoric. There have been moments in British history where there was widespread anti-police feeling, but today really isn't one of them. And I'd say the opposite. Modern Britain, with this kind of suffocating and all-pervasive climate of fear and insecurity, has made people far more accepting of the tendency of the state to intrude more and more into their affairs and, and to police our private lives. And whole areas of our lives now are kind of occupied by the state, which in the past they wouldn't have. This was kind of brought home to me this week, um, by my wife, who was a doctor, she was sent at work uh, a copy of the government's new Prevent Strategy, which is supposedly a, a, aimed at stopping people becoming terrorists. She's a doctor, as I said, by the way, and supporting terrorism. The paper outlines a number of ways by which healthcare staff can protect the country and protect each other from radicalisation and how to stop vulnerable people from being drawn into terrorist-related activities. You know, asking doctors to be snoops is bad enough. What's also bad enough is this, this document was released in 2011. 
So it's been out there for two years without any kind of like hue and cry against it. So if there was a kind of anti-police movement in Britain, or there was a really strong fundamental anti-police rhetoric, I think that would have been part of it, actually. That would have been taken up. So if that's the situation, why are the police under the cosh? You know, why are the police in a bit of a mess? And as, as somebody said, you know, just look back to the riots of 2011, where the police stood like rabbits in front of headlights, not knowing how to police. So what's really going on? And I think briefly, I'd say that the police, like many other, other institutions in modern Britain, Church of England and the establishment, seem to have lost their internal coherence and relevance in modern Britain, suffering at best from apathy and at worst from contempt for what they stood for in the past. An attempt to kind of move away from that and distance themselves to make themselves more relevant has actually led to internal incoherence, leading to a, a, a weird mixture of kind of internal incoherence and impotence, but also instability on the street. And I think the police, being damaged by archaic practices of old, have attempted to move away from that. And I think a good example of the problem they've got themselves in is what's called the canteen culture. The canteen culture basically is where people have dinner, they talk, they joke, they tell sexist jokes, homophobic jokes, whatever. The kind of esprit de corps of the police of old. Not the kind of esprit de corps most of us here would particularly like. But in getting rid of that, getting rid of that way that the police can actually have a sense of self has created an internal problem because the police no longer know how to operate. I work with sections of the British police these days and I was speaking to a guy recently from the National Domestic Extremism Unit. And he's, this is not an ordinary policeman, this is a senior detective of the, of the Domestic Extremism Police in the UK. And he says the police don't know what to say internally, scared of saying something out of place. A police force that can't even, say, can't even speak his mind internally is going to be incoherent on the street. And for me, that's the problem. I, I'm not going to welcome an incoherent state where it has power and is out of control. For me, that is a real problem. OK, thank you, Kurt. Uh, Clive. OK, well, I mean, uh, just some very obvious things, but it's worth reminding ourselves. Um, the police, w originally anyway, were meant to be a civilian-style arm of uh, government. Government, of course, when the police were set up, was very small, but it was certainly meant to be a civilian arm, not um, a paramilitary one. Now, obviously, if you look at most policemen, they have semi-military uh, uh, uniforms. Uh, we've just had the increase of the use of taser guns, um, uh, automatic weapons, etc. So uh, there's been a, a step change, very recent step change, I have to say, which, although the police have always had guns, actually, there's never been a time when policemen haven't been had the guns available to them. Nevertheless, they're much more prevalent on the street. This is towards, I think, a more authoritarian political basis to uh, the world we live in. And I think that authoritarianism started with Margaret Thatcher and I think it was continued by Tony Blair. In fact, I think it, it, got, to, it got to its height during the period of Tony Blair. So, and, and I'm very left wing, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not... Uh, 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 coming from some other position. The other position is to say that they should police by consensus. That is, they're meant to police by our uh, uh, allowing them to police us. And that means they're somehow our servants, like civil servants. And of course, no one would ever think that a policeman is your servant. Uh, a policeman tells you what to do. And uh, most people are fairly uh, uh, wary of them nowadays. Um, wary of them certainly in the past. But in the past, they had a sort of a cachet sort of authority. Now they seem to be authoritarian in a quite different way. And I think that's a problem. And the problem comes from a very straightforward thing. It's a contradiction within the police force, which started off when they began. But of course, what I'm going to say didn't exist in those days, which is they are an arm of the state. They cannot possibly be uh, an arm of a free people, which of course was what they were meant to be when they were set up. They're an arm of the state. Now, when they were set up, of course, the world was very dangerous, very problematic. We're talking about the 1820s, the high point of uh, republicanism in Britain. And there was a reason for them coming in. Of course, um, a lot of Tory politicians were particularly worried at the time that uh, this was the French police force by a another name. In other words, arbitrary arrest and all the rest of it. So I think there is a problem. And there's certainly a problem nowadays. Interestingly enough, uh, just to go back to uh, the riots in 2011, I think one of the things that hamstrings police, and I'm not against the police because um, I, I think they do very difficult jobs, but certainly in terms of public order, as you were talking about, is they are now forced to use what is called defensive policing, defensive policing. And I think that comes from two, point, uh, two perspectives. I think uh, they have, they had, well, due to 2011, they were particularly worried about the cuts, 
and they were uh, concerned about human rights, uh, EU human rights laws. They then decided, instead of arresting people on the streets, I don't think they did lose control. I think they willfully lost control. I think this was a strategy. I don't think it was uh, uh, some sort of just un unfortunately just happened. They were forced, I think, to rely on technology, that is CCTV, etc., and procedure. So, in other words, they threw the weight of what they were concerned about onto the law courts, as opposed to taking the weight of policing onto themselves. And last but not least, I do think there is a growing internalisation of the police. In other words, as an arm of the state, the police feel they're permanent when politicians are simply temporary. And I think they have turned in on themselves to an extent where they think their defensive measures, their neurosis about how politicians and the rest of us view them, is causing them an inability to actually create coherent stories. Plebgate, I think, is immensely serious because it means that if they just apologise, they get away with what all the rest of us will be arrested and we'd be in court for. So I think uh, the, the application of the law across everybody, they are civilians in uniform after all, is very, is very important. I think that's the operation that we've forgotten. Okay, thank you, Clive. It seems so far then that uh, one theme is picking up and that's the internal and external co uh, confusion over the police's role. And I quite like what Clive has just said, the, the, the shift from a cachet of authority to authoritarianism, uh, but in a different way to how it was in the past. So clearly what's emerging so far uh, is a sort of nervousness and a, a, a lack of confidence about their, what their role is. Uh, next speaker, David. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the cops are in crisis. Uh, that's a pretty bold claim. Uh, and if you're seeking to prove it to me, uh, I think you would need to come up with fairly widespread and compelling evidence. Uh, the preamble uh, to this talk is in three main strands. One is about the growing police intrusion in our daily lives. The other is roughly about crowd control. I would see that as a bit of a specialist subject, but pass that by. And the, the third and more broader subject is the lack of integrity on the police's side, that they are less honest than they were, perhaps, or perhaps they've never been honest, but they, they, there is supposedly a lack of trust in the police of telling the truth. Taking the first one, which is about intrusion into our lives, the question I ask myself is, are the police more intrusive than they were, shall we say, 50 years ago? And my answer would be, yes, they are, in many respects, more intrusive. Are we therefore less free? Again, my answer would be, yes, we are. But the fault, I think, lies not with the police, but with us. Uh, there's been no conspiracy by chief constables or senior officers over the years in some covert place to grow the business uh, and put themselves more in the saddle as guardians of public morality. It's we, the great British public, who insisted that they take on this role to a large extent by changing our own our social attitudes and indeed going for concomitant legislation which has backed up those changes in social attitudes. Lots of big words there. Take two examples. If you contrast the police's attitude to domestic violence now with then, and by then I, I would take my stand in the early 60s, then in the, the early 60s, and I speak very generally here, they fought shy of this issue, would, would be reluctant to involve themselves, which is not a good news for battered wives. Today, it's entirely the opposite. In fact, in my dealings with the police, I've been surprised how much they will intrude these, in these uh, altercations. In the 60s, there were myriad ways in which you could be abusive of or discriminate against your fellow citizens without fear of legal consequences. Today, you cannot. We've achieved that to some degree by new legislation. If you allow a new legislation through the door, then the next body through the door is a police officer, inevitably. All this can cause friction and has caused some friction, but there are parts of the British population who welcome this. You know. The chartering classes of North London, perhaps to some degree, are happy that the police take a greater role in this sort of area. I can sense that that tension is there, but I, would, I could not sign up to the, the notion that in this area we are in crisis. I think this is overselling the idea far, far too strongly. Crowd control. Uh, in my experience, most police forces take a quiet pride in the way they handle large crowds. They feel they've become more expert and more sensitive. I know there will be people in this audience who disagree with that, but I'm giving you the police point of view here. And of course, I'm talking about 43 different forces. There is not such a thing as the police in this country. There are 43 forces. 
you have to keep in mind in all of this, when we're talking about crowd control, and particularly talking about political demonstrations, that their perception of their role and what their measurement of their role is much different to the demonstrator. If you're a demonstrator walking up Whitehall with your banner, your aim is to attract publicity to your cause, and perhaps, given that you've got a phalanx behind you, cause the, the government to tremble at what they're about to see. The police's approach is entirely different. It's much more prosaic and practical. They're thinking about how long do we have to close this road? When we get, can we get the traffic back on this road? How do we arrange things so that other people in this street, if it's Whitehall, are going about their lawful business and can continue to do so? When will this all end? Will these people get home for their tea? At the end of it all, the police will have a wash-up meeting. They will look at the results from their point of view. They might regard what they've done as being a great success. The organisers of the demonstration might have had an entirely different view. I'm not taking sides here. I'm just showing a difference of perception. I don't get a sense that the police are losing their confidence in this area. I, I acknowledge that they were, uh, they were dilatory two years ago in certain parts of the country, not in others. But I, I mean, I, I've had many conversations with police officers over the years about this aspect. They don't see crowd control as something that dominates their lives, but I think they, they have a growing confidence. Uh, so I don't think we're in, uh, in crisis on this score. Finally, integrity. Plebgate, Hillsborough, the death of Ian Tomlinson. Do we have a crisis because the police no longer trust, uh, that we no longer trust the police? Here I think my answer is more conditional. Boris Johnson's already broken ranks by asking Lord Carlisle to look at the ethics of the Metropolitan Police. David Davis was on TV the other night expressing a reasonable case for saying that the Federation officers in Plebgate should face a charge. However, he went on to speak about further inquiries into the systemic dishonesty in the police. And at that point, I, I reached for my revolver, or at least I sucked my teeth. Uh, I think that's rushing to judgment to some degree. On this third item, I will conclude we have not reached a crisis, despite these examples. The public's faith in the integrity of the police remains fairly intact, but there's been some damage. The danger is that the damage would be made more serious if the police defend dishonesty by indulging in further dishonesty. We call it Plebgate. It derives from Watergate. We've got to remember what brought Nixon down was not the original offence, but his efforts to hide it over mm. subsequent years. Thank you, David. Jackie. Okay. I'm going to come from a slightly different perspective. Uh, challenges of modern day policing continue to increase, as, we, as we've discussed that other panel members, placing greater demands on all police officers. Crime is socially constructed uh, and the types of behaviour deemed criminal is constantly changing, whether due to changing attitudes or changing technologies. Public expectations have never been higher and of all the criminal justice agencies it can be argued that policing is the most politicised. Policing is also the most visual of all the criminal justice agencies and is exposed therefore to, to closer scrutiny. Uh, the knowledge now required to police has never been so esoteric, demanding a range and depth of very specialist skills, and yet debate regarding the training of police officers has remained strangely absent, uh, despite Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary in 2002 uh, observing if the service is to be viewed as a profession, the initial training and development provided must be comparable with other professions. But all we've actually seen to date is a mere tinkering around the edges. So I'd argue the professionalisation of policing is long overdue. Just as we we wouldn't want to be treated by an unqualified doctor or dentist or taught by a teacher without professional training. We should expect those entrusted to uphold the law to be professionally educated and this would assist in their understanding of a role which involves responding to a diverse range of human behaviour, legislation and to respond as they are required to the needs of both offenders and victims, thus requiring a far greater specialist knowledge and expertise. Damien Green, in a speech given on Wednesday at the College of Police's inaugural conference, outlined the aspiration of the college to increase the uh, professionalisation across all levels of policing, like it was somehow um, his first good idea. He acknowledged that a university education is now seen as a staple for the career choices of many young people, but that, and this is quoting him, that, but the aspiration for more education is not being matched in the police. I'd argue that Damien Green is seriously out of touch with higher education developments in police training, due more to a failure of politicians themselves to recognise the value of higher education and to commit to actually investing into the professionalisation of policing, rather than any lack of ambition by the police themselves. He also failed to acknowledge the contradictory nature of police reforms introduced by the government which have actually acted to undermine the professionalisation of the service, for example wanting graduates to enter the service but at the same time lowering the paying conditions of newly qualified officers. 
If Damien Green had done his research, he would have found that the importance of higher education in policing had already been recognised over 20 years ago. Uh, at the institute that I work at, we've been teaching policing degrees since 1996. Uh, since this time, our department's grown substantially. It now offers criminology, policing and forensic de degrees, and we have just, uh, just under 300 full-time undergraduates graduating each year. We formed partnerships with Surrey Police and the Met to teach uh, a recognised policing qualification for our students. And since its inception in 2008, over 442 of our full-time students have undertaken that. This is now being replaced by the Certificate of Knowledge of Policing and is also going to be a requirement for those wanting to join the police. Also, a number of our undergraduate students, while studying, also undertake the roles as special constables. So the, by the time that they actually are ready to take up a profession, uh, they've already had invaluable work experience and the underpinning academic knowledge. And these are going to be the young people, our senior police officers of the future. Damien Green inaccurately <laughs> states that nationally very few officers are graduates. However, it's more useful to examine graduate entry by individual service rather than nationally. In Surrey, the graduate entry is just below 40%, and many chief constables already value the benefits of, of recruits with higher education, with increasing numbers of them being graduates themselves. Damien Green also doesn't appear to have accounted for the hundreds of currently serving officers who've taken it upon themselves to further their own professional development and to sponsor their own education in their own time and in the absence of any government initiative. At the department I work, we currently have over 200 currently serving police officers and staff studying a range of degrees. We have over 200 um, officers and some of them are studying undergraduate, some of them are doing <coughs> masters, and 39 of them are actually doing the professional doctorate with five of them already attained doctoral success. So this tends to indicate that the evolution of a professional uh, police service is already well, well underway. Damien Green announced that, and this is quoting him again, that for our structural reforms to reach the heights of which we think they are capable, slightly patronising, we need all those officers to come along for the ride to be part of the continuous flow of improvement and the risk of extending the metaphor to help its navigation. Well, to extend his metaphors even further, I'd say many officers have already boarded the ship and Damien seems to have missed the boat. To summarise, higher education is central to the professionalised police service. For me, teaching actually trains you to perform a task competently, but education provides you with a greater understanding and a depth of insight. Education broadens your knowledge and experiences. It challenges your own values and beliefs, your prejudice and myths and stereotypes, and I'd argue encourages tolerance. These are the underpinning skills and values that a professional police service requires in order to respond to the challenging demands of a diverse and global society. OK, thank you, Jackie. So from our last two speakers there, we've seen the rise of PC PCs. <laughs> uh, they're not losing confidence. People's expectations of the police force is higher than it's ever been, uh, and an overhauling of a professionalised culture was, was badly needed. Uh, OK, uh, Roger, could you give us your... Uh, OK, I, first of all, compliments to both all the speakers and to the organisers for getting such diverse uh, insights into this, because I think you've had a very good kind of uh, collective uh, picture of, of where we are. But there are a couple of things that I think uh, that need to be said. First of all, one of you said that, that you said that, that, that you can't uh, talk about the police because there are 43 forces. Well, you can't talk about any force because inside there are islands and the cultures are completely mm. different. Uh, the CID includes also the special branch and uh, uh, the, 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 uh, in, in the Met you've got this flying squad, you've got uh, anti-terrorism, you've got all of these place just just I'm just mentioning a few you've got the, the territorial support group and the uh, uh, what used to be called the SPG and every force of any size has their own version and these are what the northerners called roughy tufty policemen which feel very confident there's no I've never seen any of those guys with a loss of confidence I have to say <laughs> uh, but if on the other hand if you look at the organized serious and organized crime uh, uh, the teams, they feel completely uh, unloved and out of their depth because the technology that the villains are using is much fancier than the ones that the cops have and they don't have the training either. And fraud, the fastest growing crime in the world is money laundering and fraud. 
uh, white collar crime. And uh, they don't even have accountants or accountancy training to work with. So there's a sense in which the bad guys who speak absolutely any language you can think of, there are 320 language groups in London alone, um, are, have the field to themselves almost at that level. So there is a loss of confidence, absolutely, and c with, with justice, because they are being outnumbered, outclassed, and the battle is being lost, okay? That's at that level. What uh, the point that Kirk was making, and I absolutely agree that when you see the police in some respects as the arm of the state, what's different now is the state is against the police, or at least the government is. And there is a kind of, I think they've actually declared war on the police, not only with the 20% cut being the largest cut of all the social services, but also the imposition of police and crime commissioners that nobody wanted, 15% of the country voted for. Nobody can name their own police my crime commission unless you happen to be unlucky enough to have made <coughs> one. And there's a sense in which uh, the home, home Office, I think, the Home Secretary, sees this as a kind of virility test, leaving the gender aside. And far from the usual kind of even the ret rhetoric that supports the police, they really have declared war. Now, the interesting thing, I've been watching the police since 1979, and I wrote a book which, if any of you has 5P, you can get it on Amazon, I'm sure. <laughs> it's called Talking Blues, and I interviewed 600 coppers at the, in 1989 after the miners' strike. And what was absolutely striking about it was their paranoia. It ran through all the ranks, and they were more paranoid about each other than they were about anybody else. And it's in those days, 60% of the days lost at work were lost through stress, internal anxiety, that someone was going to give them grief. And I can't exaggerate this, actually. Anybody who has actually worked with the police will know this. They are constantly in fear of somebody you know, coming down on them like a ton of bricks, and they all think their senior officers or the, anyone above them only looks upwards. Their leadership is only upwards. So the only thing that concerns their sergeants or inspectors and so on, yeah, are the people above them, and they couldn't care less about the people below them. And that one of the reasons morale is, is at least as long as I've been looking at this, has consistently been low, is because of that. There's a feeling that nobody loves them, nobody knows what they do, nobody cares what they do, except when they do something wrong. At that point, the whole media, everybody comes down on them like a ton of bricks. And you know, there is some just, uh, you know, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you. <laughs> and that's that, I think, you know, that, but that informs the conversation. And when Kirk says, yes, so they've lost, they kind of lost their way. What I'm saying is, I don't know a time when they didn't, when the internal conversation wasn't always frightened about saying something which might not please somebody above them. And certainly in the old days when the canteen culture was rife, you did not shop any of your colleagues because you would be sent to a fight alone, nobody would come and help you, they'd put turds through your, uh, in your locker, they'd, you know, they would really do nasty things to you if you had shopped a, another uh, officer, no matter what they had done. And if you now look at the top, when not only Plebgate, but you've got, you know, you don't forget the hacking, the whole way in which the police were involved in the hacking story. John Yates, whom I knew, and by the way, was college educator, I think it was Oxford, he went to Marlborough and so on. He had 19 dinners with News of the World executives. 19 dinners. He was a deputy assistant commissioner. What on earth could they have talked about that's okay? As far as I'm concerned, it's not okay. That the, the way in which that kind of corruption at that level was normalized um, in forces like the Met. Seems to me that's where the rot is. That the feeling of a lack of accountability, a lack of honesty, and even a lack of awareness. When, um, what was he called? Not Paul Condon, the one Paul, um, the, the Met commissioner who... Stevenson? Stevenson, uh, who took a 12,000 pound treatment uh, for, you know, and said, oh, there's nothing wrong with this because I had cancer. Well, okay, lots of people have cancer. They go to the NHS and that's that. He was also making about 300 grand a year. He could have paid 12,000 pounds for his treatment. He saw nothing wrong with this, even though it had been arranged by the PR man who had worked for News of the World. And it's the failure. There's a kind of moral um, Novocaine that seems to hit these guys as they go up the ranks. And again, w what used to be normalized at lower ranks is bad behavior and the Ian Tomlinson killing and the way that was responded to and hidden by all the people around him until the video footage was produced is a good example of that, was also happening at the top ranks. Not in every, I know lots of really good chief constables who were very conscientious and mind about this stuff a lot, but some of them have actually had to quit. Uh, like Steve Pilkington at David in Somerset. He was trying to do really good down-to-earth policing, but because he wasn't ticking all the key performance indicators that the Home Office had imposed, and there were like 90 of them, um, 
he was kicked out by the guy who used to run Yorkshire Water, who had been hired by the government, and that was the Labour government, to be the guardian of police excellence. Now, what I'm really saying, and I will wind up because I'm interested in what you have to say, is that nobody really understands what the police do, including the police. Mm. And they are actually better at solving problems and keeping order than they are at crime. The crime, although crime is going down, it's not much to do with the police. It's to do with better locks on cars, people being a little more aware of this. The fact there is no market now for second-hand tellies because they're all so cheap. I mean, there are lots of factors that have nothing to do with policing that's brought crime down. But PCCs, the police crime commissioners, and the Met, sorry, and the media, and the, the politicians are obsessed with crime. Crime is actually quite a small proportion of police work. And the shocking thing for me at the end of all this was the lack of reaction to the news about prison and GCHQ. They're just simply, you know, you suddenly understand that the state in the form of GCHQ is listening to everything and everybody mm -hmm. and nobody seems to mind. I just think, hello, wake up and smell the coffee, guys. It's nothing to do with, you know, Plebgate, frankly, although I don't approve of any of that. It's to do with the spread of the authority into our lives that we have no idea about and no control over. And when the government refused a public inquiry, said we don't need it, for once the House said, actually, I think we better look at this. And, you know, how far they're going to get, frankly, I'm not very optimistic about, but at least somebody noticed that the Big Brother is here big time and he's not necessarily on our side. OK, thank you, Roger. Can we give our panellists a, a round of applause, please? OK, before throwing out to the audience, just a sort of a couple of questions to think about. I mean, you don't have to respond to these. I mean, is it the case that the police are unravelling as an institution? Are we exaggerating it? Uh, are the police simply responding to sort of broader changes, changing values in society? If the political elites are turning their backs against the police and turning their guns on them, what's behind it? Is corruption endemic within the police? I mean, back in the 1970s, corruption was always a, was a big story there. Has morale always been a problem uh, within the police as well? Who would like to speak? There are three sort of examples of, of modern policing that, for me, really sum up the problem. One was for a couple of years ago with a stuffed tiger in Hampshire where a stuffed toy um, in a field, um, the police scrambled, um, helicopters, um, they got together a, a team from a local zoo uh, with tranquilizer guns. No one actually thought to go and have a look. Health and safety rules didn't permit them to actually go and have a look in the field to see whether it was a toy or not. Another was an example, um, I think back in uh, 2007, but I'm not sure, of, of some police officers in Manchester who refused to go into the water to save yes, a, yes, yes. a drowning child and the mother of a drowned child said how can anybody yes, not go into the water when a child's uh, a, a drowning and the Manchester Police Authority actually defended their action as being in line with current um, health and safety right. rules and I suppose the last example that really sums up modern policing is the Jean Charles Dominguez in, in London who's shot um, on the underground and every single police officer at every single rank appears to have uh, at least misled the public as to who was responsible uh, for that and the, the lines of accountability, even down to who said what went. And I think those three examples really give an impression of a police force that has huge, these huge resources um, which can be mobilised. I mean, they are literally sort of everywhere nowadays. Their numbers, although lowest, the lowest for a decade, are huge um, in comparison with the past over a sort of 20-year um, period. But at the same time, they're asked to do everything. So the police no longer do public order in the old-fashioned uh, sense of, of riots or strikes. Public order is now inside the home sometimes um, with domestic violence. The police through home office targets are no longer allowed the act of discretion to decide um, themselves when something is um, or um, isn't uh, a crime. And this has actually sent the police completely out of control in one sense. is this request for them to do everything and these huge resources and lack of accountability that they have, they really do seem to um, have lost the plot. Um, is that for their fault? Uh, no, I would suggest it's, it's our fault for asking to do absolutely everything. Three brief uh, specific questions. Of, of the four scandals or problems that I, I think of top, off the top of my head, Plebgate, Hillsborough, phone hacking, John Carlos de Menezes, three uh, originated or were exclusively within the Metropolitan Police. Is there a specific problem with the Metropolitan Police or is, am I being unfair, is it because the country is so London-centric and because of the scale of the force? That's the first point. Second point is, 
I live in Kensington, which is not the most deprived borough in London, uh, but we've had a major issue of fights between schools. And I came across community police officers at Notting Hill, Holland Park, um, basically because these kids were fighting each other. And I went, I was speaking to somebody, one of the police sergeants later, and I said, you know, this is ridiculous. Look at all the problems you've got to deal with. And he said, go up to Holland Park Comprehensive and see what the teachers are like. Uh, and therefore, the point I'm making is the knock-on effect on the police, the domino effect on the police of breakdowns elsewhere, alike in school discipline, etc. That's that point. And the final point is simply about the IPP, IPCC, which hasn't been mentioned yet. And I've got some experience of it lately. But, you know, they're supervising this inquiry by West Mercia. What the hell does that mean? You know, um, you know West Mercia are, are being supervised. And therefore, when Deborah Glass speaks out and disagrees with the outcome of the West Mercia inquiry, a police commissioner, and I totally agree with you, what a waste of time and money. Uh, elected by whom? I mean, hardly anybody. You know, he then calls for the abolition of the IPCC because he's keeping in with his chief constable. So much for greater accountability. I mean, what are we going to do? Well, police have got to be stopped investigating themselves. Sure. It's Thank got you. to be Thanks. truly an independent investigation. Yeah, there's two things that have struck me recently in the last few years anyway. One was the way the police policed the riot, which seemed to be um, rather feeble in terms of standing back and allowing the riot to take place, which you know, perhaps that's to do with they don't have a sense of trust or there's risk involved. But it was very peculiar, I thought, that you know, I'm not a great fan of the police often, but when there's a riot, I expect the police to act like riot police. And I was very, as far as I can see, the riot spread essentially because the police stood back and kids around the country could see it's a free-for-all. And they even said so on the television. So that was very peculiar. The other thing is, uh, in Scotland, Sir Stephen House, who's been made the head of the whole of Scottish police and has now, has now been made a Sir, has cut his teeth, as far as I can see, on promoting domestic violence as the main issue. And it seems to be almost that we've moved from the police, as people who police public order, to people who police private order. So our personal relationships, our sense of well-being, so the policing of language, policing of domestic, policing of relationships, policing of Facebook, policing of Twitter, all these things, there seems to be a major shift. And I wonder if that actually helps part of the confusion, the emergence of the sort of PCPC, and the fact that, does that connect anyway with the fact that they stand back and allow people to burn shops down? I mean, just listening to that, it's, uh, um, it's remarkable the, uh, um, the parallels between the police and the NHS, actually. The couple of state monopolies, and I've just put down some, some points here. And I, I agree that um, we've got to be careful that the, the police force doesn't end up like the NHS and becomes this sort of political football that's kicked around and you know, with all people with their own agenda sort of picking at it. In the same way, the NHS is, you know, a different NHS around the country. It's postcode lottery. The police is, is similar in that regard as well. But uh, like a sort of large monopoly, I, I think um, you know, it does need investment in, in the police. It does need review and an overhaul. The IT systems are woeful. That's on the one hand. But separately, there needs to be you know, a, a, an improvement in, uh, in, in accountability as well. So um, I, would, I, would like the, I would like the panel to consider that. Okay, so just some of some of the key points that have been flagged up. Uh, are, are the police becoming, you know, too risk conscious? Is it health and safety gone mad? Is the Met a specific problem in itself? Is there an ongoing problem of the police just investigating themselves? Uh, do we have a dangerous situation where the police have vacated public order but are obsessed with private order? Do we end up with the, with the worst of both worlds? And is there the problem of accountability? Uh, still at the heart of the issue of the police. So if I start perhaps in the reverse order, Roger, okay. if you'd like to pick up, you don't have to pick up all of those, but any of those, no, no, feel fine. free to I do will. so. Okay. I wanted to start with the first speaker, um, just sitting down here um, looking at his iPad. <laughs> uh, the point is uh, that the health and safety issue is one that curiously gets very little publicity. But I did a film uh, called uh, Ready for a Riot about the training for the G20. And I discovered that all of the officers, it wasn't just Ian Tomlinson's uh, the, the attacker that was, as it were, out of control. They were all trained on what was Saturday night town center policing, which is, if necessary, you're outnumbered and you expect to, and you kind of lash out with your truncheon to keep a distance. 
They were doing that in a very crowded circumstance, which was extremely dangerous. And we had footage from all over the G20 showing it wasn't just that isolated event. And when we interviewed, of all people, Sir John Stevens about this, he said, if you dress them like Robocop, they'll act like Robocop. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, we don't, I don't approve of this, but we had to do it for health and safety. Now, nobody's ever said that the reason that that G20 police went so badly wrong was health and safety. But there's the commissioner of the Met saying that. And the policing of the 2011 riot, which you will know better than I do, included a whole lot of health and safety issues uh, where people didn't know what to do. But the really interesting thing, and I commend you another report I was involved in, which is the Tottenham Regeneration Task Force, is that they, they, they learned nothing from the previous riots. Nothing. Exactly the same thing happened. The commander went on leave the day after the shooting of Mark Duggan. They didn't use the golden hour. They didn't use the community links. They learned absolutely nothing. So this exactly the things that went wrong in 1985, 86, 86 it was, happened again. So if the police aren't learning anything, then they're obviously not going to, you know, uh, move in the direction we hope in terms of accountability. I totally agree about the lack of accountability, and I would love to see the IPCC or somebody else have the teeth to do something about it, but they don't. If police officers don't want to testify, as it were, against themselves, and they've got legal representation, they don't have to do it. So that just renders the IPCC really pretty ineffective, and David will know more about that than I do. Thank you, Roger. Jackie. Um, I think with regard to the, to the riot situation, I think we've got a situation now that the police are, are damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. So when they do respond, um, if incidents do happen like the Tomlinson one and, and, and officers do go too far, uh, then they're criticised. And I think in the 2011 riot, I think it was a case that they were paralysed by fear in yes. case they did the wrong thing. Um, so it is very much a situation that, that they're in a no-win no situation uh, with regards to that. So I think there needs to be some, some scrutiny of that and, and, and some... I know they were talking about a code of ethics, but I think we have to acknowledge that the danger the police put themselves in, whether they're dressed as robo cops or not, they've still got uh, people there whose intention, because not all the rioters are writing for the right reasons or the, or the reasons stated, but they're there just to cause trouble and, and to harm police officers. So I think that does need to be acknowledged when we're looking at how the, the a police... there's lack of leadership. That's yes. The, you know, in yeah. that situation, they need Lack leadership. of leadership, yes. absolutely. Yes. Yes. With regards to domestic abuse, I mean, it wasn't so long ago that the uh, police treated uh, domestic abuse as just a domestic and thought that mm. uh, dealing with stray dogs was more important. Mm. I mean, thank goodness for first wave and second wave feminism that we now actually recognise it as a real crime. I think probably what's most disconcerting as always is it actually a fact that more violence happens within the home than perhaps happens in the streets. Uh, and I think that's what the uh, statistics tend to show us now. If you do actually look at the statistics, and it's not actually just an issue for women, we don't know the extent of male victims of domestic abuse. Uh, but at least uh, feminism in raising the issue of uh, violence within the home and abuse within the home, because, again, I think we have a greater understanding now that it isn't just physical violence. It's far more insidious than that. It is as um, uh, outlined with the definition um, of domestic abuse now does include controlling and coercive behaviour, but it isn't just that of women. Um, and I say, when we look at the statistics, there's a huge amount of violence in the home rather than in the private. Why on earth would you treat uh, violence in the street more seriously than you would violence uh, upon an intimate, somebody that you're in a relationship with, somebody you should trust. Statistics do show that if you're a woman or a child, you are far more, far more likely to be harmed by somebody that you know. Killed. Uh, well, we had two women a week still is the t uh, statistics. That's been a statistic for a long time. Uh, children under the age of 16 far more likely to be killed by a carer or a guardian or a parent than a stranger, but the emphasis is always on, on stranger danger. There is a concern. I mean, laws used to protect men um, so that they could actually continue to abuse their families. Whereas mm -hmm. uh, with the laws now, is the state actually there to prevent it and to protect vulnerable people? And I think that is the way that we should be going rather than allowing that type of abuse to go ignored. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, David. Yeah, I'd like to talk about stuffed tigers, but I must avoid it. I think we <coughs> move on to uh, things I know a bit more about. I should say I, I left IPCC four years ago. so. There's some cases I speak of, I, I'm speaking as a member of the public, I have no inside knowledge. Jean-Charles de Menezes, unfortunately, I do have. I was the commissioner for the investigation that we did into that, or one of the two, Stockwell 1, Stockwell 2, we called them. Stockwell 1 looked at the shooting itself and what happened around the scene. Stockwell 2, which is 
my responsibility um, was looking at what was happening at headquarters. I don't accept uh, the view that all the police officers involved were all in, in the business of, of uh, denying responsibility. I think some were, but some were not. And we did establish a line of responsibility, at least and a timeline in the sense we found out what happened and in what order it happened. What still mystifies me to the, this day, and this is more in terms of uh, what was happening back at headquarters, was the incredible scenes where we had one set of senior police officers briefing the press, knowing that this man was a Brazilian electrician, but putting out their commissioner to face up to press conferences, still insisting that this was a terrorist. And that there is what you call politics within, this, within Scotland Yard. There are things in that, that uh, putting aside the shooting itself, I mean, I, I too, and I'm reflecting the, uh, what's been said on the platform, is I, the Met are a special case. They are a more political force than other police forces. Their relationship with the press over years, it leaves me uncomfortable on occasions. Uh, they, are, they were altogether too cosy with some members of the press. Uh, and indeed, they were a, a rather loose mouth. There are things that in, got into the papers that ought not to have got into the papers, which put prosecutions at risk. Getting deeper into the dry detail of Plebgate, again, a case I know of second hand, uh, to explain what a supervised case is, and sorry, bear with me, this is going to be a slightly long answer. When there is a, an investigation carried out, offered up to the IPCC, they can do one of three things. They can make it an independent investigation, which means that they, they use their own investigators. They have their own teams, they move in and do the investigation. They can do a managed investigation, which where we take our senior investigator and we insert him into the force, and he's in charge of the investigation, albeit lo using locals. Supervised is the weakest of the three, and all we're saying there to a force, and this is what happened in Plebgate, you get on with this investigation, uh, maybe that was a misjudgment where we shouldn't have made it supervised. I say we, I'm, I'm not there anymore, but uh, uh, you get on with the investigation and keep us appraised of what's going on. What's happened with Deborah Glass, and I speak with some authority since I rang her before I came to this meeting, mm. is that she was happy with the report. There's nothing wrong with the report. What bugged her was the conclusion. Uh, and uh, people say, why, don't you, why didn't you take over with the investigation? Because it clearly it was wrong. Well, she said, no, the investigation is fine. What I didn't like was the, the joint or the disjoint between what was the investigation showed and what the conclusions show. And that's why I went back. There's a, a dry legal point in all of this. By the time she went back, the report had been finished and therefore legally the investigation's over. Therefore legally, she's ultra virus if she types, tries to take it over. So she couldn't, much as she was frustrated by it. You know, the, New readers begin here. That's that. That's the answer to that one. What else can I say? I'll say no more. Okay, I said, well, I said well, too well, much. I mean, uh, come back to anything. Right. Uh, okay. On the second round back, uh, Clive. Okay. Well, just a very quick thing on rioting. No one's been convicted of 2011 riots. There was no official riot. So let's be completely clear on that. No one has been convicted of rioting. Rioting requires a conspiracy of 12 people, and um, the only people who have been convicted of riot were people who are unknown and not been convicted in the case of an insurance claim by Sony. So uh, there, there's no riot going on. There was something going on, but it wasn't called a riot. And the reason was is because if, if you said someone was a rioter, the top punishment could be 10 years in prison. And that's completely different from community service, however many hundred hours. So it's quite an important legal point, I think, to make there. The other thing to say is that um, I think Plebgate is important. I'm going to go back to it because I think that the idea, if there's any distrust in institutions like the Met, is because there's no sense of fairness. There's just a belief that they can get away with anything. They can trample on any law that they want. And the idea of fairness, the idea that someone is in a uniform, but nevertheless like you and me, and it's the uniform that represents the institution, not the person, and the person believes they are part of the institution that can be immune. And I think the immunity of policemen to prosecution, an apology, if I was doing that, I'd be banged up. So I think it's just out of proportion to what's going on. So I think that's very, very significant. I think unless there's fairness seen, and I think that's across the board, and sometimes it's very difficult, and it took a very long time, for instance, to get the fairness out of the Hillsborough case, for instance, is very important. And I have to say, unfortunately, I think one of the problems is professionalisation. And I think that's happened in every single institution of British life. And I think one of the parts of professionalisation is health and safety, uh, is human rights, is other things that intrude 
on moral decisions which can be made on the basis of common sense and common law. And I think that's quite significant. And, and a lot of stuff has overridden that because people are scared to make a move. When you're in a hierarchic situation, I presume the police is as hierarchy as the, hierarchy as the army, I presume, then you're always looking above and below the whole time. You must do, <coughs> because it's a natural way of processing things. And if you're not, you're looking to your colleagues. And either way, you're looking for, um, you're looking for a sense of feeling part of a community. And feeling part of a community is not going to be going against whoever. OK, thank you, Clive. Uh, Kirk. Um, I actually think the institutional crisis of the police is much more fundamental than the, the speakers are saying. And I also think it's much more dangerous for us all. And I say that as somebody who's not particularly a police groupie. I mean, when my daughter was old enough, the two things I say to her is that you can't support Sunderland and you can't become a policeman. Uh, so I'm not, um, but I do actually think there's this fundamental problem here because I think that we have a state machine exercising power without real purpose. Two quick examples. I support a football team, Newcastle United, and they are, this week they were seen to be the f football club with the most arrests, or the most them for one game against, against Sunderland with a fifty cups on the street. But if you look at how the police police football hooliganism, which doesn't really exist anymore, it's really interesting. The police don't no longer seek to get between the fans. What the police do, and watch it whenever it happens, they videotape what's happening. And it's not just for health and safety reasons. They videotape th th what's happening, then afterwards knock on doors and they arrest people. That's not policing. That's not it's not policing at all, actually. That's not what the police should be there for. I'm not, as I said, a, a firm support of the police, but you see the police acting kind of impotently. Another example which I think indicates how fundamental the crisis of the police is, is the way the police these days organise around domestic extremism. Mark Kennedy, the undercover policeman who spent more of his time under the sheets impregnating <laughs> environmental activists, he used to work with a, a police unit I actually have to have some dealings with because of my job. And one of the points they make these days is it's just about impossible these days to get a senior officer to sign off to, be, to, to allow undercover policing to take place. Unless you can show this real question of national security, you can't get the, the police, senior police officers, to sign off to undercover policing because of the, what, what happened to Mark Kennedy and the rest of them. Now, what happened to Mark Kennedy and the rest of them isn't just some kind of aberrant behaviour. It's basically they lost what it was to be a policeman. They spent all their time hanging around, shagging environmentalists, <laughs> Greenpeace activists, animal rights activists. They lost what it was to be a police person. Now, I'm, as, you know, that, and that is, an, for me, an, an, an example. These aren't like PCs on the streets. These are so-called hardened coppers who have been through everything whose job is to track down domestic extremists. If those people don't know how to police, don't know how to operate in that situation, my God, what would the ordinary PC on the street? No wonder they're in a mess. Hi, I'm not sure about your names, but it's the gentleman to the right of you. <laughs> you made a statement earlier on um, that was saying that it is society's fault that the police are interfering more in our lives because of the way that society has changed, because of the way that we act now. Yeah. I completely disagree with this mm -hmm. because for the la it's safe to say that in the past 10 years society has massively changed but society changes all the time it is no there is no reason um, for people for the police or the government anyone to expect society to conform to any kind of um, authoritarian view or any kind of a view which means that the police controls everyone's lives also young people don't know any different. As a 17-year-old myself, I don't know too different, but I know that there are alternative ways, ways of living and of viewing the police. But when those riots did break out in London and across the country, I was 15 years old. How was I supposed to know what was good and what was bad at that time? Obviously, none of my mates in Milton Keynes were doing those those riots, you know, nothing goes on in Milton Keynes for anyone to care. <laughs> well, That's true. But I did know people who knew people who were in those riots, and they were saying, "Yeah, oh, you know, it's the police's fault." I did. I also knew people whose whose dads were on those streets, and they had completely opposing opinions. I don't know what to think. How do you expect young people to view the police these days when the police or the government or the media? don't know what's going on with the police and what do you impose on teaching? What, what would you like teachers to say to their students on this is what is happening with the police these days? 
So I'd like to try and expand on this idea of professionalization. I think there's probably a difference between professionalism, acting professionally, and then increasing professionalization of the police. And actually, I think that this perhaps speaks to, or might be one of the ways of understanding how the police, if not in crisis, is at least fundamentally changing. That, um, so if, if, if there are two basic ideas of what the police would do, one would be like a lefty view that it's like the police just exist to be the arm of the state, and one's a sort of conservative view that the police, your local Bobby who goes around sort of having a bit of knowledge. Neither of those two things require a degree. Because if you're just smashing working class, you just that's just brute force. And if you're just going around being a local Bobby, that's just something you've grown up with. So these sort of traditional understandings of what the police might do have sort of broken down. And in their place, there's been an attempt by... Uh, an act, the grow, growing in academia of this is, I think, a response rather than a driver to a sort of sense of loss what the police is supposed to do. So if, if no one's really sure about what the police do, the natural thing is to try and we'll all sit down and we'll codify. But what's happening is it's an absolute mess. And so because there's no instinctual understanding of what the police is to do, it becomes more professionalised in rigid rules that seemingly have no end, rather than being professionalism, which requires a sort of implicit understanding that you don't necessarily need a degree for. Um, the, the two crimes that the police were founded to combat were um, theft and riot. You know, to the extent that a theft of a, of, of a penny would, would be, the police would come down with a force of, of bricks upon that person. I think that the reason for that was that essentially the police were founded in, in not just in the state, but in bourgeois social interests, you know, in a, in a class of society that was essentially about bringing order to the streets and, and, uh, and fighting the unruly masses and that sort of thing. And I think it's the detachment of the police from any kind of social interest, because those are the two crimes that now the police are uniquely uninterested in. You know, if you get something stolen, then uh, people don't call the police or accept to get the insurance certificate. So I mean, I think that that detachment from social interest means that they're kind of free floating. I think there's a shift towards PR policing. So the founding of investigations as a kind of media campaign and behavior policing, as, as has been said. And this kind of random inverse, the more that they're interested in something, like the less public importance it is. So almost like the more serious something is, um, the less the police are interested. The smaller it is, the, the, more, they're, the more they're interested. So that kind of um, inverse proportion to the actual public importance of, of something. So I think that that, that, kind of, that kind of detachment... I, I'm really interested in why there's this conflict between politicians and the police. Um, why the police... Why were the, the police out to get politicians? Why are the politicians out to get the police? That's extraordinary. Um, I spent some time in Bolivia and... Uh, periodically there was a shootout between the army and the police um, in the city streets and there was this kind of like and that was a, a failed state right so is it just the case that um, the state institutions are becoming unhinged and the, but w why on earth would, would they be out to get each other in that way it doesn't seem to make any sense thank you I'll be as quick as I can uh, a little bit like Kirk I too have uh, every reason to be critical of the police um, I've had the baseball bat, not the truncheon, the baseball bat round the head. I've been imprisoned in the miners' strike and told by the Prime Minister of the day that um, I may be done for treason. Won't bore you anymore, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, but I, too, I think this criticism of the police today is very much a faux criticism. It's not a real criticism as such. And I think what we need to ask is, when we say it's the police, it's really important because it's not like the health service, it's not like the education uh, system. It really is an armed body of men. Now, a lot of people in this room today won't see the armed body of men apart from guys with rifles at the airport. You only see the armed body of men in action when there's social conflict. We haven't had an awful lot of that for about 30 years in this country. But you do see it when there is social conflict. And I think that's the point I'm trying to get to. I'll be as quick as I can. That the police, in a way, the crisis within the police force is not really a crisis within the police force. It's a crisis within its paymasters. And that's the real problem. It's not a personal problem of particular police inspectors or professionalisation. The police basically reflect the problems, the institutional problems with the elite today that pays it. The police have always carried out the political will and the laws of the political establishment. And the problem is it's the political establishment, the elites today, that are a real problem, not necessarily just the autonomous police force on its own, because it's never really existed autonomously. Yeah, um, I agree with the last speaker, and I just want to add on to that. I think it kind of reflects a problem within society. So, we, so everyone 
um, accepts the police force. They don't question the police force. They don't question its roots. But what they do question is the methods that they take, um, what they might be policing, things like that. But I think what people need to do is question the roots of it. And I agree with Kirk and um, his historical contextualization of the police. Back in the 80s, um, you had groups like the Bradford 12 and the Birmingham 6 and so on. But you don't get that these days. And I think society just kind of accepts the police. But really, people need to be questioning the roots of it and its existence as a whole. OK, thank you. So we've had confused attitudes towards the police, the young people. Professionalisation uh, is not needed. They're detached from any social interests, and we've seen the rise of PR policing instead. Uh, there's a broader crisis within the political elites, uh, and we need to look at the police's roots rather than its methods. Rather than taking everybody, because I wouldn't mind going back to the audience one more time, does anyone want to respond specifically to what has been said so far before I take it back out to the audience? If I could just pick on one or two individuals. I think there's a, a general, I don't know how the audience feel, but a sort of crisis in governance in a way. I mean, the, the, the government aren't just attacking the police. They're attacking practically every public sector uh, organisation at the moment. And I don't know whether that's yes. a, a form of deflection. I mean, they're not just picking an argument with the police. They're picking an argument with the teachers recently that have striked. They're picking a, a, a fight with our health workers. All of these public sector workers, we rely on all of them. If they all decided um, to not go into the professions on the advice of their parents, then you know future generations are going to really suffer without the, without these workers. So I think it's important to have fair treatment of them rather than being seen as as an easy target when there's austerity and they're the easiest ones the government can pick on. So I do think the government needs to be very careful about the fights it's picking with with its own public servants. Well, I, I guess just very very quickly. I mean, um, I think it's interesting we've been talking about public order because most people have thank God, have, have no relationship with dangerous crime. So it's very difficult to know about a murdered you know, relative or something like that. If you've got no, you know, we, we, we see so much on the television that, that pushes us that the police just deal with those sorts of crimes. We don't see very much else. So there's sort of propaganda war going on all the time. But more importantly, this is the point I would like to make, I think, and to, to my point of view from looking at these things, the state and arms of the state have become detached from the government of the state. And I think that's why they're against each other. I think the state stands for ultra-conservative views of permanence and other things, and the government doesn't. And I think that's a problem, and I think there's a disjunction, a dysfunctional uh, situation that will go on probably for the next 20, 30 years. You know what the lady said that you know, with, with other, if you look at other industries, financial services elsewhere, you get independent bodies like the FCA, the PRA. You've got the Bank of England as well. They're very, they've been made independent by the government. Can't we have something for the police, for example, that is is independent and can and oversee the governance and direction and remit and give an appropriate mandate, and as a consequence, isn't isn't subject to those short-term vagaries in the political environment? So it won't be subject to that political expedience, what's in flavour one day and moves to the next, but equally is accountable to the public in, in setting up that particular body. We've come back a few times to the uh, crisis of authority, and I think that is connected to where the police uh, derive their authority or had derived their authority, either from the state or from the public, their meaning, their purpose, uh, and both the public and the state um, the government, there is a, a crisis there because we're not quite sure who the public is anymore and who those interests are. It's, and I think that when authority becomes questioned like this and becomes diffused like this, and I think there is a real sense of a, a diffusion of authority, um, it becomes um, both more petty, more arbitrary and more dangerous. And uh, I certainly think that, you know, we've, that whether dressed as Robocop or whether wearing the sort of high visibility jacket and um, the, in the sort of role as the community uh, warden, um, that a, a great deal of authority on the streets now is um, both mean and trivial and petty, um, but overbearing and authoritarian and um, arbitrary. And I think it's the arbitrary nature which is the greatest threat to us um, in terms of, of, of the democracy. And I think it's really perhaps the, the rediscovery of the public and who they are and who we are and what kind of police force we want is, is at the, the root of this. A question that leads on quite nicely from that is I'd like to ask the panel what they think about the Police Crime Commission. Is it something that was brought up uh, briefly earlier? Um, but what I'd like to know is, in your honest opinion, how realistic do you think is it to expect the Police Crime Commissioner and Police Crime Commissioning Boards to actually make a difference to policing to help 
create better policing, more efficient policing, which is obviously what they're trying to do? Or is it simply another form of influence that's just getting in the way of proper policing? I think the, the crisis of authority, which is very widespread in all kinds of institutions across society, means that no one really knows who's in charge. Who finally, where does the buck stop? And you've seen that with a, a number of investigations by the police recently, where the police arrested Damien Drick Green in the House of Commons, hmm. um, where the police investigated the Cash for Honours system, um, where the police carried out, I think, their biggest operation in their history with Operation uh, Wheating, Elfenden, and all the rest of it. And that seems to show a real, a real crisis of who is really in charge, because you, you could ask yourself, why is it that the police are involved in, in that kind of operation? OK, thank you. The one thing I want to say, if I leave you with anything, because I'm, it's a theme that kind of was picked up indirectly, and Jackie was saying, was about whether the intrusion into people's homes, domestic violence, is some kind of PC policing that is a reflection of an abuse of power. A child dies every two or three days. A woman dies every two or three days, and we don't know the degree of male uh, violence. Rape remains very stubbornly unreported and unprosecuted because nobody gets convictions. Now, it seems to me that the point of policing is to protect, the, as it were, the body politic and the citizens. And as uh, I think it was Clive said, we, you know, we rely on the policing by consent because it's one officer to every 450 people. Now, the culture is still not aware of the extent of child abuse and domestic violence. And frankly, I don't want you to get confused by other issues about an abuse of power like Operation Prism and the need to protect vulnerable people because that's real. Okay, thank you, Roger. Uh, Jackie? I think just picking up on the PCCs, I think really we've just introduced another level of populist politics, really, in, in, at, at local level. Um, and all that introduces is short-termism, because all the PCCs yes, are going exactly. to be doing what they want, what, you know, what's going to get them re-elected. So I think really the PCCs are acting out of self-interest, uh, rather than perhaps the interest of their, their local communities. And again, any long-term aims are, are going to be ignored um, for, for favouring short-termism and re-election. And, you know, six, six chief constables were sacked. What message does that, that, does that send out to, to police and, and their own autonomy if the PCCs can just sack them if they don't fit their, their views? Uh, I think we should all be very concerned about that. OK, thank you, uh, Jackie. David? Uh, yes, I find myself in the opposition of defending the police again. I don't buy into this notion that the police are out to get politicians. They were certainly out to get one politician on one particular evening, but I don't think there's any great conspiracy amongst the police either to attack politicians, either of this government or the previous one. Nor do I buy into this notion that politicians are out to get the police, unless get has a specific meaning. You've got George Osborne and this government in the business of cutting back public expenditure, and they're attacking everyone, and the police are one of the bodies they'll go for. But I don't think there's any particular malice in that. However, and so others might disagree, on the appointment of the new uh, oversight, I too am not a great enthusiast. I, I had a lot to do with police authorities in the old days. They had their weaknesses, uh, but they didn't do a bad job. And I, don't, I think there is some short-termism in the new system. That's all. OK, thank you. Uh, Clive? Well, I was just going to say that there's a lot of policing now that didn't happen before. I mean, I just, just think of CCTV, local government, uh, wardens, social workers. There's lots and lots of policing of our private lives. Uh, and I'm not a particular libertarian, but it does seem to me that the, the policing of private lives has become much more diffuse. And the fact that there's violence and danger in people's houses uh, can very often be uh, prevented by other means. Not always, but certainly. The police very rarely get in when the violence isn't happening. So the pre preventive policing doesn't happen with the police force. Preventive policing happens with social workers and other people who are aware of the moral climate of the people they're going in to see. Thank you. Uh, Kirk? I mean, a glance at British history would, would show you that the police and the establishment have really tried through for decades and decades to present the police as a service. Mm. If you look at um, the general election night, whatever party wins that, that election, the voter counted, the person walks up to the ballot box, announcement speech, whether it's liberal, social democrat, whatever. What's the first thing they always say? I'd like to thank the, I'd like to thank the police for being here tonight yeah, yeah, for protecting yeah, yeah. The, the ballot. Mm -hmm. Even the most right-wing politician in France or Germany really wouldn't say that. It would be unheard of. You wouldn't do that. But that attempt to present the police as neutral, as there as public servants, as, as representing the state, is key. When you have that fissure between the establishment and the police, that's a cause for concern. 
you know, that indicates there, there is a, a problem there, and that's a problem not just for the police, but for wider society. As a police force, unsure how to police, whether to be soft or hard, and that's a danger for all of us. OK, thanks, Go. Uh, I'd like to, to uh, thank the panellists for a great speech today. I think it's been an excellent uh, discussion and debate with a wide range. <laughs>